studio. So I'm gonna start from the very early days with the, the humble or not so humble beginnings depending on your background and where you came from. Um, but I'm really curious about your, your journey to the UK, to London, where your parents were before you came here, where you were born here, where you were born in Nigeria. And then obviously um, how that influenced your life and your art. So just a very brief like, narration of that, um, that beginning. Well, I, I, was born in, I was born in London. Okay. And um, my parents took me back to Nigeria when I was three years old. Okay. And so for the most part, I grew up in Nigeria. And then I came back. Uh, here when I was about 17 okay. and um, I liked art when I was at school I've always wanted to do art uh, but coming from a Nigerian family uh, my parents didn't really want me to do that okay. you know so and my father was a lawyer so he would have actually uh, preferred me to study law yeah. uh, but I chose art instead okay. that didn't go down too well with the family uh, but eventually they got used to the idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, so, but then I kind of went to art school and, um, you know, that's where I started doing my work. But then I studied art history and obviously, you know, mostly Western art history. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really see any role models. I didn't see... Um, you know, we were not really taught any artist of African origin. Um, so, you know, it was mostly, I guess, you know, modern art, you know, and also kind of, you know, impressionists, Picasso, mm -hmm. surrealists, mm -hmm. uh, then up to kind of, when I got to know more about contemporary art, then I started to kind of see the works of, uh, particularly, you know, a lot of kind of early feminist artists from the United States, um, African-American artists from the United States, you know, but most of, a lot of that was kind of, a lot of things I kind of found out about myself, uh, particularly, you know, the Harlem Renaissance in the US, um, you know, David Hammonds, mm -hmm. and then later, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat. So nothing from Nigeria? Well, in Nigeria when I was young, um, there were quite a few artists that I actually, because I, I used to go to um, workshops, okay. art workshops in the museum in Lagos, mm -hmm. actually at the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I found out about a number of artists uh, there. And so there were artists like um, in Arab uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, Yeah, so I saw you know, his works. And, um, and then, you know, but at the time, I wasn't sort of, because um, I was quite young, so I didn't really know enough about what was going on. I mean, but I was in Nigeria when uh, Festac 77 happened. Oh, okay. That was a festival of black arts yeah. in 1977. Mm -hmm. So I did get to see a lot of art and also mostly performing arts as well, like, you know, music. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, um, you know, and that was a time when, you know, Stevie Wonder and uh, Kula and the Gang and all those people came to Nigeria. So it was a, a very kind of memorable uh, festival of the arts. Okay. So a lot of performing arts, you know, I saw there. And at what point did it become clear to you that you were going to become an artist or that it was possible for you to become an established artist in the UK? Or was it, was it always clear that there is a path or it was just, let's see how it goes? You know, to me, it was always clear. I didn't, you know, I didn't see myself doing other things, you know, and I, I actually thought, you know, worst case scenario, I, I'd actually teach, okay. um, you know, but I never thought I wouldn't do art. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone else didn't believe me because they thought it was an impossible thing to achieve. Mm -hmm. But I always believed that I wanted to be an artist, yeah. And how did you navigate that sort of external gaze and perception of are you a British black artist, black British artist, African artist, Nigerian artist? Were those labels? What were the labels at the time? And also, who were your 
contemporaries? Were they British artists or other black artists? Like, um, well, you know, a story that I often tell. You see, when I was at art school, I saw myself actually just as an international artist, you know. Okay. And um, so, I, you know, I was very interested in politics. So I was making work about what was going on in Russia at the time. Mm. Uh, Perestroika, you know, Russia was mm. changing. Uh, the then Soviet Union was changing. And, and I made work about this. And one of my tutors said, well, you know, you're African, and you want you producing authentic African art. What's Russia got to do with you? Uh, and that's, and that really made me think because um, I then started to think about the question of authenticity. You know, what makes an artist an authentic artist? Mm. You know, um, in a world where we're all influenced by so many things, how would one define that? And that's how I ended up um, in Brixton Market okay. and looking at the African textiles. And then I found out that actually a fabric I always considered authentic yeah. uh, had this kind of Indonesian origins mm. and, you know, and then produced by the Dutch and then sold in West Africa. Mm. I thought that was kind of fascinating that actually the fabric is also about a relationship with Europe and Indonesia mm -hmm. and Africa. Yeah. And so that's how I started to use, um, you know, the African textiles in my work. And was it called Ankara at the time or there were other names for Dutch wax or? Uh, well, Dutch wax, okay. you know, was the, yeah. Yeah, and, um, but I was also very interested in identity politics because I was at the time um, reading kind of a number of kind of post-colonial texts. Mm -hmm. So Edward Said, uh, Gayatri Spivak, uh, Homi Baba, mm -hmm. and then also French critical theory. So there were people like, you know, uh, Derrida. Um, so deconstruction uh, was uh, kind of a, you know, an important thing at the time. So deconstructing, deconstructing the canon mm -hmm. as well. Um, and of course, I wanted to understand my own place within history and within the history of uh, imperialism mm. and colonialism. How did I end up in London? Yeah, you know, question. why am I speaking English to that's you that's now? That's a big question. <laughs> why am I not speaking Yoruba to yeah. you? Yeah. So I wanted to understand all those things. But you speak Yoruba? Oh yes, okay. of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Yoruba speaker. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm bilingual. Uh, but I, you know, wanted to understand all those things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, some of my research took me to the Victoria and Albert Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the early costume pieces I made uh, kind of started as a kind of, um, you know, making fun, really, of Victoriana, yeah, you yeah. know, of Victorian costumes. Yeah. Um, you know, and then do the last thing you expect an African artist to do. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, you know, number of works evolved out of that. And how, how was that received? Like having the, the tailoring of like a Victorian dress, but with a supposedly African fabric print? Well, I mean, they must have gone down very well because, you know, I was, uh, you might have heard of the exhibition uh, Sensation. Sensation was the kind of the main exhibition for kind of, you know, hip, okay. young British artists and that, mm -hmm was part of uh, Charles Saatchi's collection at the time. Okay. And Charles Saatchi was uh, one of the most important contemporary art collect collectors in the 90s. Okay. And so there was a show of his collection at the Royal Academy. Mm -hmm. And so, and that show included a number of people from my generation referred to then as the YBAs, the young British artists. I mean, we're not young were anymore. You part of, were you part of that? Well, I mean, I always considered myself kind of on the outside. Okay. I ended up, you know, in a number of shows with so, some of the artists, you know, mm -hmm. in that group. And, you know, the group included, you know, Damien Hurst, uh, Tracy Emin, Sarah Lucas, um, you know, some of the, you know, better known 
um, artist in that exhibition. But that really exhibition was a seminal exhibition that really marked the uh, beginning of the whole you know, explosion of, of my career in a way. Um, can, you, can, you, can you talk a bit about the performative photography element to your work? What was that born out of? Well, again, you know, now we are uh, we're used to ideas around, you know, BLM and Black Lives Matter. Um, visibility was something that was very important then. Because whenever you saw someone of African origin in the media, uh, they were usually, I mean, mostly you just see wanted people on TV, <laughs> um, you know, or riots poverty. <laughs> or poverty. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily see a black person in a position of power or leisure mm. and and I wanted to challenge that because actually those works were shown on the London Underground as huge posters mm. and yeah and so literally millions of people saw that series mm. yeah so they were kind of made for the public you know public space at that time actually art wasn't being displayed on the London Underground so I, I would imagine that was probably one of the first, one of the first things. Okay. Great. Okay, we'll dive right into the um, exhibition at the South London Gallery, Lagos, Peckham, Repeat, Pilgrimage to the Lakes. Um, I think I'll start by asking what your relationship with Peckham, you know, okay. South London in general, but Peckham specifically, um, what are your earliest interactions with this well, hippie, uh, hippie well, <laughs> migrant? I <w> well, <laughs> I was, um, I, I used to live in South London. And um, I had a studio just around the back of the Oval Cricket Ground and not too far from Peckham. So I used to go to Peckham. I had a few friends there as well. And of course, you know, Campbell School of Art yeah. is just down the road mm -hmm. from there. So I used to hang out with quite a few people down there. And um, yeah, and, you know, and I even dated somebody in Peckham. <laughs> so. Um, you know, and then of course South London Gallery. Yeah. You know, I mean, great shows, and so yeah, the the art world was, um, you know, before the art world actually really moved east, because I also studied at Goldsmiths College as well. Okay. You know, which is not far from there, yeah. and um, so it was a place I, I used to hang out quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. So um, while conceiving the the exhibition, which like I'm co curating. My initial thoughts were, you know, substituting the, the term migration with a pilgrimage, which yeah. is more empowering to that little Lagos in, in Peckham, that migrant community. And I was thinking one way, you know, that post-independence sort of migration of Nigerians to the UK and the United States for whatever reason, education, you know, economic reason, what have you. But then um, after our, you know, earlier interactions, I was thinking about the, the reverse that's happening right now with um, Nigerians who are in the diaspora, who are born in the UK, in Europe, and I'm making that, that repeat pilgrim um, to, you know, back home to Africa, to Nigeria, to Lagos. And that brings me to like Gas Foundation and it's, it's a humongous uh, undertaking and I'm really curious about your um, your vision for it. Um, it has so many moving parts, but and it's something. I mean, Lagos is a pretty hard place to navigate, you know. Even for those of us who are, you know, who've been grinding there forever. Like, w what was that? When was that moment? What was um, what was the trigger for you that you know I have to do this? Well, you know, there are many reasons why I started, you know, Guest Artist Space Foundation. Um, first of all, in a cultural exchange, there are a number of people here who don't really understand Africa or they've not been to Africa. And, and there's so many stereotypes in the media as well. Um, and actually, there, there could be a kind of mutual exchange because there are also many creatives in Lagos. Mm. Um, but there has to be a way for people to be able to 
have conversations about art, I do research across cultures. Um, you know, it's useful for both. It's useful for people on the ground in Lagos. It's very useful from the international guests who will go there. And, you know, and you can develop exciting projects uh, together. Yeah. And also just to kind of stop ignorance um, as well. You know, that's also very important. And then also the kind of cross-disciplinary aspect. Um, as you know, there is a farm, um, which is part of the project. As if we've got a 54-acre farm in Ijebu, yeah. and where you know we're growing a number of crops, and many artists are actually interested in making work about environmental uh, issues, and so we've had quite a number of residences, do residences, you know, um, do residences on the farm. And also, you know, we've had a number of exciting residents also in Lagos. And they've come from, from Germany to, you know, parts of the United States. And we mix them with African artists. So that whenever you do your residency, there'll be an African artist on the residency. And, you know, and I just think it's amazing the kind of works that people are doing. You know, we have a uh, small gallery there, and we also have a performance courtyard mm -hmm. in the front, you know. Um, so, and I think everyone can benefit from that, um, you know, from that exchange. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions. One is, yeah, pretty personal, but who would Yinka Shonibari have been if you were born in Lagos and you never left Lagos? Well, if I never left Lagos, I probably, I probably would have been an artist still, or an Afrobeat star. <laughs> <laughs> um, before I get to my last question, I just want a commentary on this, um, this beautiful picture here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's a poster for my first exhibition okay. in uh, London, in a gallery called Bedford Hill Gallery. Um, in Tooting at the time. And I wanted to do something, I guess, you know, eye-catching. And, um, you know, I was a young artist and I had dreams of being famous. Of course. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and they came true. <laughs> you know, so I wanted to do a poster that would just kind of be slightly different. Okay. Um, so finally, my, my final question, which is totally off script, completely mischievous, but it's, um, it's born out of your work, which, you know, sometimes it's satire, it's, um, it's a bit of a parody, but it's beautiful aesthetically, it's charming and, you know, a lot of critical undertones. Um, you know, this in some instances, in some cases with different people has been, you know, controversial, but I see that you wear this. Um, with grace, you know, you have several awards, you know, as a commander of the British Empire. Is it something that, I'd I like to understand like your disposition towards it because, you know, sometimes it's like people question why people accept it, um, but you carry it with a certain grace, you know, and um, you are who you are despite, you know, all of, I find it very, it's, it's charming, so I want to hear from, yeah, from you. Well, you know, I talked about BLM earlier, you know, Black, Black Lives Matter. And I don't think that uh, culture and race uh, means that we have to always be on the outside. I think that, yes, people don't like, um, you know, an, uh, any kind of award that's kind of associated with our royalty or the royal family because of the history of colonialism. But that said, you know, that is the establishment. And so we can't always keep ourselves on the margins. On the contrary, I think it's actually, we're better off being at the center of things mm -hmm. and being in the establishment so that actually we can start to change things from within. And I think that, you know, so I don't really believe in the idea of self-marginalization. 
Um, I think that the predictable position would be for me to have rejected it. And as an artist, I don't like to do the predictable things. <laughs> because that's just kind of following another norm, even if that norm is uh, on the opposite side. But it's still a norm nevertheless, because many other people have rejected it. So therefore, an artist of African origin is predictably expected to reject it. Yeah. And as an artist, I don't do predictable. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Yinka Shonibare, CBE, <laughs> commander of the British Empire. Thank you very much for coming to the studio.